This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. Twelve years ago, in the summer of 2011, I went to the Orange County Fair in Southern California to see Bob Dylan in concert. But Bob Dylan ended up being far from the main event. After the concert, wandering the fairgrounds, I walked by some farmed animals on display. Above each pen was a whiteboard with two bits of information. Name and purpose. So, above a cow, name, colon, Bessie, or whatever it was, purpose, colon, milk. Above a chicken, again, the name and the purpose, eggs. And above a pig, name escapes me, but the purpose I remember, meat. Something inside me rebelled. At the time, I did eat meat, but it seemed that the pig's purpose must be so much more. To befriend other pigs, to wallow in the mud, to eat and drink and live to do whatever it is pigs do. I looked into this pig's eyes, and I could see someone looking back at me. And the idea that this living, thinking creature, that its entire purpose could be reduced to meat, to being merely a future dead body, violated some deep conviction that I did not know that I held. I would like to say that I never ate pig again. It would be another few months before I made that change. But on that day at the Orange County Fair, I decided I would start eating less meat. The first time in my life, I decided to change my diet for ethical reasons. It would not be my last. A couple years later, in spring 2013, I finally made the leap to become vegan, eschewing not only meat, but dairy and eggs as well. Next month will mark my 10-year anniversary as a vegan, and I can't imagine ever going back. It's one of the best choices I ever made. But it's also more than a personal choice, it's part of a broader ethical and political commitment that I hold, something related not only to my own diet, but to my entire worldview and politics. So on today's episode, I'll be talking about my journey from an animal-loving kid to a full-on liberationist vegan today. And because it's storytelling animals, I will be mentioning a number of articles and books that I read along the way that were influential on me. And there's a link in the episode description on my website. I've posted uh, a list of resources on these issues, articles that I've written, articles that others have written, and books in various topics that um, help shape my views on animals along the way. So I should say hello. Welcome to Storytelling Animals. Welcome to episode 40, one year after I launched this podcast, the season one finale of what I've been calling a green new podcast on climate ecology and animal justice where we use books to help make sense of the environmental crisis and think about what comes next. Next season, I won't be able to call it a green new podcast anymore. So thank you so much for everyone who has listened so far, who likes, follows, or subscribes, who signed up for my free weekly newsletter, and especially those who give a small monthly donation on Patreon or a large one, um, where for, you know, a modest monthly charge, you help keep this podcast going. uh, And you also get some perks such as early access to episodes and membership in the Storytelling Animals Book Club. Now is the best time to sign up for that newsletter and or for the Patreon, because that's going to be your best way to keep up with this podcast while I am on a short hiatus between Season 1 and Season 2. I'll probably be starting back up again at the beginning of April or so, um, so just about two months, and that is time I'm going to use to read some more books, conduct some more interviews, and basically just plan ahead. So if you are a Patreon subscriber... Um, You might be able to get some of those Season 2 episodes early, possibly before April, if I finish early enough. And as a newsletter subscriber, um, you'll be able to keep up with what's the plan, you know, who I'm interviewing, uh, what the schedule is, and also what I'm reading, what I'm writing, um, other fun updates. Uh, You can also join the aforementioned book club, either as a Patreon subscriber, or you get a free trial membership as a newsletter subscriber. Um, We meet every month or two on Zoom. The next meeting is going to be at the end of this month, February 28th, at 5.30 Pacific, 8.30 Eastern, to to talk about the climate fiction novel Appleseed by Matt Bell. It's a creative, genre-bending, and I think ultimately hopeful take on our future, although hopeful has an asterisk. And I interviewed the author on the podcast a while back as well. Um, For more information on the book club, you can go to datemartindale.com slash book hyphen club. There's a link in the episode description to that as well. I should add, though, um, that the HarperCollins union is on strike, and Appleseed is a HarperCollins title. Um, The union is not asking people to avoid buying books, Um, but, you know, I I do think it's worth pointing out that used books are an option, library books are an option, Um, 
and the strike has been going on for more than two months at this point. So I will also include a link in the episode description for how you can support the strike and the workers. I will not be interviewing HarperCollins authors until the strike is resolved. And then after Appleseed, our next book club book is going to be Wild Souls, Freedom and Flourishing in the Non-Human World by the wildlife journalist Emma Maris. Um, this was actually the first ep- or first book ever featured on this podcast. You can go back to episode one from, again, over a year ago to listen to it. Um, it's about conflicts between animal ethics and the environment and conservation. Um, and probably this will be sometime in late April. I don't have an exact date yet. Um, but I'll keep you posted, and the book comes out in paperback in March. Um, So that's sort of what we're timing it around, is that for those of you who want the paperback, I want to give you time to both obtain the book and read it. So, like I said, late March, early April or so. Or, excuse me, late April, early May. The best way to stay posted about when that will be, again, is either subscribe on Patreon, where I'll be posting updates, or subscribe to the free newsletter, which will probably not be weekly for the next two months. Um, but will be at least monthly. Anyway, two quick words on what this episode is not. It is not the most rigorous philosophical argument possible for veganism. Um, There's a time and place for that, but I thought I'd be a bit more narrative here and talk about my own personal story and journey and some of the ideas and convictions I developed um, that were influential on me. Um, rather than, you know, reading an academic paper aloud to you. Um, It is also not a full description of all the political implications of veganism and what a vegan world could and would look like and what a vegan political movement should do. Um, And lastly, I talk about my own health at one point in the podcast. I want to at least acknowledge that not everyone has the same um, bodies, same nutritional needs. Uh, I do think that the uh, nutritional benefits of animal products are generally vastly overstated, but it is definitely possible that for some people um, their systems don't do well on a purely vegan diet, So, or maybe you need to transition more slowly, or maybe you have to be more intentional about what you eat than I do if you become vegan. And I don't want to downplay any of that, um, and you know, maybe in the long run there's a role for like lab-grown meat type stuff for that, or other creative solutions. Um, the original definition of vegan is as far as is practical or possible or something like that to avoid animal products. Um, And yeah, I'm not saying do something that will injure yourself, um, but I am saying that this is something that probably more people can do than you think. Uh, And that for me anyway, uh, it's works well, and I hope you at least explore it with me. As I do briefly discuss, the point for me is not purity, although I do try very hard to avoid um, having meat, dairy, eggs, and honey in my diet, um, but to join a political movement that is against the exploitation of animals, and part of that is not eating their flesh and their products that are the product of exploitation, uh, and in a way it's impossible to avoid those products entirely, but to the extent we can, uh, I think we should, and anyway, here is why I do. dogs who I considered some of my best friends. In elementary school, my career goals were to one day host my own wildlife show on Animal Planet or the Discovery Channel in the vein of the Crocodile Hunter or Jeff Corwin, who I particularly liked. I watched a lot of nature documentaries, I did a book report on Jane Goodall, and I liked going to wild animal parks, zoos, even SeaWorld. More on that later. I grew up in Southern California, only a couple hours from San Diego, and I have many fond memories of the dolphin shows in SeaWorld and getting splashed by Shamu. Um, While my career goals later shifted, my love of animals, wild and domestic, remained, and even in high school, for an 11th grade job shadow project, I shadowed someone who worked at a local teaching zoo. But even as a young person, I was somewhat conflicted by this love of zoos and SeaWorld. As young as age 11, in 6th grade, I wrote an assignment for school arguing that, quote, all zoo animals should be trained to be set free in the wild. I found the assignment at my parents' house last year, and honestly it went even harder than I remembered. Animals have feelings and are smart too, I wrote. 
Imagine being confined to a cage and looked at like a museum exhibit. We should be kinder to our wild cousins. I went on. Being trapped in a small area certainly doesn't present opportunities to do their true inner calling. Animals should be set free. Cages are way too small, even if they're big, because animals are meant to roam the wild. You have to ask yourself if animals like sitting and doing almost nothing all day. Putting aside the, you know, logistics of releasing animals who don't know how to live in the wild directly into the wild, the underlying argument, I think, still is sound. Um, and there's one question I raised as an 11-year-old in May 2005 that I'm going to want to return to today. Quote, is a little human pleasure worth the freedom of so many animals? Honestly, that's the question that can crumble the whole house of cards on which our civilization rests. In college, I would be asking that same question about meat and animal agriculture. Is a little human pleasure worth the freedom of so many animals? And the answer, it seems to me, has to be no, it's not. Their fundamental freedoms must come before our slight culinary preference, or our having a fun day at SeaWorld, or how cool we think we look in our leather jacket, our preference for a purebred golden over a shelter mutt. Those preferences aren't strong enough to outdo the, you know, lack of freedom and, and suffering involved in procuring them. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So in high school, the same year I did the job shadow at the zoo, I wrote a song from the perspective of an orca at SeaWorld who had killed their trainer. This was a few years before the documentary Blackfish came out. I tried to capture the boredom and trauma of being an ocean creature stuck in a swimming pool. And around this time is when I first watched the documentary Food, Inc. This was my first exposure, at least the first exposure I remember, to the concept of factory farming. I'm not really going to get into the details of the horrors of factory farming in this podcast. This information, or at this point, the information is out there, um, and I encourage you to uh, look up a documentary or read articles or watch YouTube videos um, if you aren't really familiar, but the short version is that the overwhelming majority of farmed animals in this country and increasingly the rest of the world spend their short lives in abusive, overcrowded indoor enclosures where pigs and egg-laying hens and field calves often, often can't even turn around. I remember being outraged and upset when I first learned about this. I remember thinking this was an important issue someone should do something about. But I was in high school, and at the time it didn't really occur to me to change my diet. I didn't know anyone else in my life who had given up meat for moral reasons, or I don't remember knowing anyone who did, and I guess it wasn't on my radar. I'll also say that Food, Inc., while it's critical of factory farming, is, as a documentary, it's ultimately supportive of smaller-scale family farming model where grass-fed or pasture-raised animals that are treated kindly until they're shipped off to be killed. So it's not really trying to make anyone a vegetarian. The documentary isn't trying. Um, so today I have criticisms of that approach, which I might get to later, but at the time... I probably would have said, yeah, we need to transform our food system of farming animals, but I didn't really know the level of change that was needed. So anyway, this brings us back to the Orange County Fair. I looked into the eyes of a pig and said, no, your purpose is not meat. I decided I would eat less pig and less cow from then on, um, although I didn't cut them out entirely. And at the time, I was unmoved by chickens and fish, which I now regret. Um, but it was my first step in that direction. So a month or two later, I went off to college at Princeton University, and as I was deciding on my fall classes, an upperclassman suggested I look into a class called Practical Ethics, taught by a philosopher named Peter Singer. I had not heard of Peter Singer at the time, but I looked him up and saw he'd been on the Colbert Report twice, um, so that was a point in my book, and uh, one of those times was to discuss a book he had written called Animal Liberation. I watched his interviews with Colbert, and I read reviews of the class, and saw that many former students said the class had turned them into vegetarians. After my encounter with the pig, I was at least veg-curious, um, so I signed up for the class, and it ended up being probably the most influential class I would take in my entire four years at Princeton. Singer timed the section on animal ethics to be right before Thanksgiving, and he showed us videos of a turkey factory farm in class. Um, as well as some other mistreatment of animals, and talked about the philosophical implications. 
And so in November 2011, I found myself at the airport headed back to California for Thanksgiving with a pile of reading for class on whether to eat meat. One of those readings was a short article called The Basic Argument for Vegetarianism by the philosopher James Rachels. Rachel's argument begins with the principle that it is wrong to cause pain unless there is a good enough reason. It's a quote. Um, this seemed fair to me. Uh, he goes on, quote, The question, then, is whether our enjoyment of the way meat tastes is a good enough reason to justify the amount of suffering that the animals are made to endure. It seems obvious that it is not. Therefore, we should stop eating the products of this business. We should be vegetarians instead, end quote. Honestly, it seems to me that simple argument should be enough. It astonishes me that this has not been more effective, that people don't treat factory farming like one of the great moral issues of our time. It's a simple enough argument that I had more or less intuited it as an 11-year-old when I asked whether a little human pleasure was worth denying animals their freedom. Here the question is whether the taste of meat is worth inflicting horrendous suffering. And Rachel's right, if we want to even pretend to be ethical beings, how could it be? If you had to inflict pain on your dog or cat every time you had a burger, it would probably make you think twice about having that burger. Why should it be different for a distant pig, cow, or chicken, or turkey? And really, this argument did not apply exclusively to meat. In Singer's lecture and in my readings, it became clear that the egg and dairy industry also employed brutal methods. So for a brief moment on that flight, I thought I was going to become a vegan. But I didn't, or at least not yet, um, after reading an excerpt from Michael Pollan's The Omnivore's Dilemma. Pollan also does a lot to elucidate the horrors of factory farming, um, but the part of the book that at least temporarily led me away from veganism was actually a section about the damage done by plant farming. Specifically, he brought attention to the number of mice and other field creatures that are killed by machinery involved in industrial-scale crop production, and he calculated that an all-vegetarian diet, an all-vegan diet, would actually kill more animals than one with a modest amount of animal products from small, non-factory farms. Sometime later, I would learn that Pollen actually just got the math wrong here, which is frustrating for me. Um, but at the time, I worried that going fully vegan would kill even more animals, um, so when I landed that plane for Thanksgiving, I wasn't entirely sure what I would do. In Pollen's defense, I do think it's important to consider that there's no such thing as a, a perfectly pure um, way of producing food. There, you know, as eaters in the world, we must do some forms of destruction. But uh, yeah, I wish that he had gotten the math right and not delayed me becoming vegan by a year and a half. So anyway... There I was. Uh, I had a Thanksgiving dinner with my girlfriend um, and her family, my girlfriend at the time, and she had been at the Orange County Fair with me and was also eating less meat, but um, I think she might have been a little worried that I would throw a wrench into Thanksgiving. She assured me the turkey was from Whole Foods and, you know, lived happy outside, allegedly, um, and so I shouldn't worry about it. And so I did that year have Thanksgiving turkey for what thankfully, was the last time. Now, obviously, James Rachel's basic argument for vegetarianism um, is not quite as simple as I thought it was at the time, because clearly it hasn't worked on everyone. Um, and one of the complexities is that it is incomplete, as he himself acknowledges. It's based on the suffering of factory farms, but he explicitly in this article has little to say about smaller-scale so-called humane farming, or hunting for that matter. Singer himself is also less focused on these situations for the most part. Um, for those who aren't familiar, Singer is a vegan, although he says he'll eat dairy or eggs at someone's house or in a social met setting where to reject them would be inconvenient. Um, he, as a philosopher, is primarily concerned with animal suffering and more ambivalent about whether death itself is wrong. Um, at the time, I wasn't sure what to make of that either, um, so I ended up, somewhat to my regret, writing my final paper on the argument of a philosopher named R.M. Hare, who wrote a piece on why he is a self-described demi-vegetarian, which means that he's mostly vegetarian, but the only eat meat he eats is specifically bought from farms that he knows to be kind toward their animals. Uh, again, we're going to complicate what that means soon, but 
He argues that this is actually preferable to strict vegetarianism, because not only are you withholding money from the factory farms, but you're actively supporting the so-called humane farmers who are doing it right. While I found this logic compelling at the time, um, my demi-vegetarianism only lasted about a month before it turned into full vegetarianism. Um, we also, in the class, did some reading about the impacts of animal agriculture on the climate and the environment, which are quite significant. Um, I'm not going to get into details here, but you can easily look it up. Uh, animal ag is responsible for about 15% of greenhouse gas emissions, a huge portion of human land use, freshwater use. Um, you can grow the same amount of food. Uh, same amount of calories with plants on a lot less land with a lot fewer resources. Um, Senior took the angle this is an issue of global justice as well, um, because eating less meat would allow us to grow more food, better feed the world. Um, and also we learned that U.S. meat-heavy diets aren't particularly healthy, um, and plants can be better for you. So all in all, I was sold that we needed to abolish factory farms, that we needed to drastically reduce meat, dairy, and egg consumption, um, you know, I was critical of, of fishing too. Fish farms can be poor conditions and wild caught fish. It seemed like every way of killing them was going to be painful, whether it's a hook through the face or suffocating on the deck of a ship. Um, that's a painful death. So hard to justify, at least in a society where alternatives are readily available. But still, I thought, well, maybe there was room for a small amount of meat, dairy, and eggs coming from so-called humane farms. Um, but in practice, like I said, I, it wasn't long before I cut out meat entirely. For one, in practice, it's actually very hard to know where your meat comes from, um, to make sure that it comes from a kind, sustainable farm is hard when the overall majority of meat doesn't. Um, and second, eating meat had started to feel kind of weird. Um, so in his book, Animal Liberation, Peter Singer argues for a principle called equal consideration of interests. The idea is the interests and desires of all sentient beings, that's you know creatures who think, who feel, who are capable of pain and pleasure, um, that all of their interests and desires should be considered equally. Uh, and to not do so would be to exhibit a prejudice, in this case speciesism. It's a clunky word, some people don't like it. I sometimes prefer human supremacism, but um, I do think it's a useful concept. Anyway, not all animals have the same interests, so this doesn't mean that we have to treat all animals exactly the same. You know, I have an interest in owning a bicycle while a fish does not. But there are many deep interests that are shared widely. Interests in avoiding pain and pursuing pleasure. Uh, in fact, since writing the book, Singer has somewhat simplified his view uh, thinking the only things that matter now are reducing total suffering and increasing total pleasure, um, or at least that's my current understanding of his work. But anyway, the details are beside the point. Um, this approach does make it difficult to think about death um, because it's hard to know whether a creature who might not necessarily have you know an abstract concept of death has an interest in avoiding death. As I say that loud, it, it, today it kind of seems obvious that any living creature has a fundamental interest in avoiding death, um, but it's something philosophers debate, and at the time it seemed like one of those things that's impossible to know. Um, but even with that, it's still really calling for a moral revolution to consider that the suffering, pleasure, needs, and wants of every other creature are just as important as our own. People make counter-arguments I might consider later, but this seemed overall a compelling argument to me. And once you accept that, um, it really changes how you see the whole world. Um, not only meat, but clothing, zoos, animal research, the way we displace wildlife, everything. Um, so once I started thinking of other animals in this way, as fellow creatures whose interests mattered, I kind of stopped wanting to eat their corpses. At the time, I was not convinced it was ethically wrong to kill them, like I said. I think that now. Um, so long as the killing was painless, which in practice is exceedingly rare, even with the Humane Slaughter Act that applies to pigs and cows, um, but especially with poultry and definitely with fish. Painless killing in practice is not at all a guarantee, um, but even if one was okay with painless killing, it started to seem almost crude. Animals were friends, not food. They were fellow creatures, not objects to exploit, and why would I want to eat them? 
I'll add, because this is a books podcast, that Peter Singer's Animal Liberation, although it came out in 1975, is still a solid place to start if you're wanting to learn more about these issues. He lays out the moral case against speciesism, describes in detail some of the horrors of factory farming, as well as the environmental costs of meat, and traces the history of how Western civilization has viewed animals. Um, Also talks a bit about research as well. I have my disagreements with him, um, including on, you know, on killing, on, on research, um, some of which will come up later today, but if I were in charge, it'd be taught in high schools. That said, it is a HarperCollins title, HarperCollins Unis on Strike, so I'm not telling you to go buy it right now. Um, I have put a list of other resources on my website um, that is linked in the episode description um, of other places to start if you want to learn more about these issues. So anyway... In 2012, with a couple exceptions, which I won't get into, um, I was vegetarian, at least in theory. Um, I had also told myself I would only eat dairy and eggs if I knew where they came from. This was somewhat doable in my college dining hall, which made a big deal about sourcing from supposedly humane sustainable farms. Um, But realistically, in other contexts, I did not know where my dairy and eggs were coming from. For the most part, I ate them anyway. as a vegetarian, I, I kind of started to feel better. Not that I felt bad before, unhealthy, but I, I definitely noticed feeling better in my body, uh, with which I suspect was a combination of both physically eating healthier and psychologically feeling more aligned with my values, feeling more of a sense of purpose. In a bit of a coincidence, my mother was undergoing something similar. She'd been dealing with an autoimmune disorder for a while, and after switching to a whole foods, mostly plant-based diet, Uh, she managed to kick most of her symptoms. She's vegan now, she'll turn 64 next month, and she's on a mountain biking team. And she's gotten a lot of her biking friends also to eat fewer animal products. Um, She gave me a book to read called The China Study, which explored how meat, dairy, and egg heavy diets of wealthy industrialized countries are linked to higher levels of heart disease and many cancers. Um, And so spring break of 2013, I decided I would go vegan as well. I knew I had not fulfilled my commitment to only eat dairy and eggs when I knew where they came from. I knew they were bad for the animals and bad for the environment, and if it turned out they were not even good for me, I figured I had no excuse. I think my body likes this change as well. Um, Vegan food sits better in my stomach, and in my 10 years vegan, I've gotten sick much less frequently than the years before. I know everyone responds differently, that some people struggle with the initial conversion, um, you know, have difficulties getting certain nutrients. And of course, it does not cure all diseases or raise the dead. I've had my own share of health problems. Um, But I do think it's worth emphasizing that the idea you need meat for protein or milk for calcium is not entirely true. Uh, And there are narratives out there about health or or the idea that vegan diets have to be a lot more expensive, um, that there are resources out there to help you find a, a cheap, and affordable and healthy uh, vegan diet. So 10 years ago, I cut out dairy and eggs, and I have not intentionally eaten meat, dairy, or eggs since. In a way, this was only the start of my vegan journey. Um, The writer Franz Kafka, Franz Kafka, looking at a fish in an aquarium is reported to have said, now I can look at you in peace. I don't eat you anymore. In a similar way, I feel like only after becoming vegan could I really look and think about animals without cognitive dissonance and really develop a more sophisticated view of animal ethics. But before I get into that, I want to get into the counter-arguments people make. So the basic argument for vegetarianism that works so well on me um, has yet to transform the world. I imagine most people today have at least a vague sense that animal agriculture and industrial-scale fishing, as typically practiced, are abusive toward animals, destructive of the environment. This has not really caused a revolution in how we eat. It has caused some changes. Um, I shouldn't be a total downer. Um, In polls, a majority are at least somewhat concerned about the treatment of farmed animals. Um, A 2018 poll commissioned by the Non-Human Rights Project found that only 6% of Americans uh, think non-human animals, quote, don't need much legal protection. So the other 94% think they do need legal protection. And in fact, 46% said they deserve, quote, the exact same rights as humans. I I don't know what they think they mean by that, um, because obviously 46% aren't vegetarian, but also they aren't cannibals. 
but at least they say animals deserve the exact same rights. Anyway, ballot initiatives have passed in, in California and other states um, that at least modestly improve uh, animal welfare on farms. Um, a 2016 ballot initiative in Massachusetts uh, passed with a whopping 78% of the vote. This, these are way more popular than any other issue almost in, in ballot measures. Actually, not even almost, than any other issue. Uh, most Americans even oppose experimentation on non-human animals in polling, um, a practice often viewed as you know, more justified than eating meat. Nearly one in four Americans uh, ate less meat in 2019 than the year before, um, including 31% of people of color and 31% of women. And for 41% of those, animal welfare was a major reason. And for an additional 24%, animal welfare was a minor reason. So, so a quarter of people ate less meat, and two-thirds of those were at least partially motivated by animal welfare. But clearly, there's still ways to go. Factory farming is still spreading across the globe. Um, animal agriculture is still a powerful industry, and obviously, most people aren't vegan. It's still a relatively small minority that are even vegetarian. So... What are the arguments people make against it? First, people might reject the notion that speciesism is a bad thing, that we should consider other animals' interests equally to our own. Um, so why shouldn't they? People will say, well, it's because they're animals. Um, but by itself, that's not good enough. Uh, after all, we're animals too. So when pressed, people talk about the differences between humans and other animals. Um, Historically, some have denied altogether that animals think and feel at all. Um, so who cares what we do to them because they're just unfeeling machines. This is increasingly a fringe minority position. Um, sometimes people accuse animals of living only in the moment, and this might make it okay to kill them because it's not like they had any plans for the future anyway. Uh, this is the argument Martha Nussbaum made on this podcast with respect to fish. It's worth noting that she pointed out there is tons of evidence that mammals and birds do not live in the moment. They have conceptions of the future and past, so she still thinks it's wrong to kill them. But even with fish, I think it's extremely premature to, to, to declare that an entire taxon lives in the moment. There are cleaner fish that seem to manage extensive clientele. They, they eat you know, dead skin flakes off of there are fish that make little sand sculptures for prospective mates. It seems like maybe they have plans and intents that don't seem to be 100% limited to the present. It's honestly kind of hard to imagine a functioning animal that lives purely in the moment. Um, maybe a newborn baby does, but we don't eat them. So even if a fish does live in the moment, I'm not sure why this automatically makes it okay to, to rob them of <laughs> their one and only precious life. I'll talk more about killing shortly. Uh, people also bring up animal language. Uh, human language is, you know, more sophisticated, more abstract, more symbolic, uh, whatever. But a lot of animals do have very complicated forms of communication. Um, I also don't know, again, why it should matter. If you think of the reasons why it would be wrong to murder a human or keep them in a cage, you would not say because they have language or because they don't live in the moment. Or it's... Much of what makes my own life worthwhile to me, joy, play, meaningful work, love and relationships, seems to be shared widely across species. If these are the things I don't want to be robbed of by being killed, perhaps other animals, again, whether they could articulate this idea or not, deserve not to be robbed of them needlessly either. One argument that seems to be particularly popular among some on the left is the idea that only humans are subjects of history. Animals are merely objects that go along with the flow. What they mean by this, from what I can tell, is that humans take our own destinies in our hands. When we are oppressed, we rise up and struggle and demand justice, while animals apparently don't. This is the view advanced by Marxist biologist Stephen Rose, who, by the way, professionally experimented upon animals, had a bit of a dog in the fight, so to speak. Um, <laughs> what a unfortunate metaphor, um, but yeah, there was a Jacobin article arguing something similar a few years back. It pops up here and there. It just doesn't really make sense to me. For one, again, I'm not sure why 
being an object of history should mean you are free to be exploited. But more importantly, animals do act with agency in the world. Their choices shape their own lives, that of their communities and ecosystems, and even the future evolutionary trajectory of their species in some cases. And they absolutely protest their oppression uh, in their own ways, as I talked with Ron Broglio on an earlier episode of this podcast on his book Animal Revolution. I think the disability studies scholar Sonara Taylor puts it best. Animals consistently voice preferences and ask for freedom, she writes. They speak to us every day when they cry out in pain or try to move away from our prods, electrodes, knives, and stun guns. We deliberately have to choose not to hear when the lobster bangs on the walls from inside a pot of boiling water, or when the hen who has passed her egg laying prime struggles against the human hands that enclose her legs and neck. We have to choose not to recognize the preference expressed when the fish spasms and gasps for oxygen in her last few minutes alive. Considering animals voiceless betrays an ableist assumption of what counts as having a voice. In her book, The Suburban Disability and Animal Liberation, um, which is maybe the best book I've read on animal liberation issues, Taylor builds out her argument that, in a way, speciesism is just another form of ableism, the idea that certain forms of cognition are more valid, more valuable than others. I should add, too, that Singer, who I mentioned earlier, is often criticized for his views on disability, and in Beasts of Burden, um, Sunara Taylor actually meets up with him, describes a conversation, and I think offers the most thoughtful critique uh, of his views that I have seen. So anyway, to return to that excerpt from her book, the situation is not just that humans could choose to be more benevolent, but are not doing it. It's that we're actively ignoring and repressing their cries for freedom and justice. Another common distinction people make between human and other animals is that allegedly only we have morality. And I'm sure we do have more complicated ethical systems and debates than other species do, but ideas like fairness, compassion, and cooperation do not come out of nowhere. They exist in other species and other social mammals like chimpanzees and wolves and dogs absolutely have social norms that define how they interact with each other. You can get punished for violating them or their consequences. So if we humans are in social relations with other animals, why should we feel free to violate any conceivable norm that might exist um, other than might makes right? Maybe there's a way to establish some form of interspecies um, code of conduct. And even if not, more to the point, it's always seemed to be pretty perverse to me that t the idea of using our morality as an excuse to act with such cruelty, such disregard for morality toward other creatures. I'm sure they're so impressed by our vaunted morality that permits us to keep them in tiny cages and kill them. So I think what a lot of this boils down to is our preconceived notion that other animals are kind of dumb, you know, quote unquote. This is why I stopped eating mammals before I stopped eating birds or fish. When I looked in the pig's eyes, it looked smart to me. When I looked in the chicken's eyes, it didn't. I now recognize this is you know, a wildly unscientific way to approach ethics. It says way more about my lack of perception than anything about chickens. In recent years, scientists have argued, such as Franz de Waal, have, have cautioned against... Um, painting animal cognition as a ladder or hierarchy with humans on top, instead looking at how different animals use their brains differently in ways that are tailored to their own specific uh, circumstances. In the book An Immense World, which we did for book club uh, recently, Ed Yong points out that the way cow's eyes are set up, they can see a 360 degree field of view. So people often think that cows are kind of slow because they don't look around much, so they don't seem that alert but that's because they don't need to. Um, I think what we need to understand is that from our perspective, it is the human viewpoint that seems so full and vibrant. And we look at thing, other creatures that don't have our viewpoints and think, you know, don't have all of the brain features that we have, and we think, wow, their worlds must be so poor. They're missing this, they're missing that. But there's so much that we don't see about their worlds, features they have that we don't, and... Also, like, they don't know about ours. To them, their perspective is their whole world. 
to them, their perspective is not lacking. It is everything. Their interests are as fundamental to them as ours are to us. To rob them of their full world is to rob them of everything they have. This is why I now pretty strongly oppose the needless killing of thinking and feeling creatures. You know, whether or not they live in the moment, whether or not the killing is painless, whatever, I still don't think we have the right to rob them of their world, their perspective, their even fleeting joys and pains and just the experience of being alive that there will never be another creature just like that one, never be another consciousness just like that one. I don't think we have the right to just snuff that out um, with no good excuse. And I don't think food is a good excuse when we have alternatives available. People might in turn say, okay, sure, animals matter, but um, can't that be a problem for after the revolution? You know, shouldn't we help humans out first? First, I, I want to point out that we don't really say that about any other issue. No one is like, let's hold off on expanding healthcare until we've helped immigrants, or vice versa. And if people do say that, most progressives would rightly criticize them. We shouldn't be pitting oppressed groups against each other. We should be trying to help everyone to the extent we can. Um, and also ignores the ways in which the issues we care about are connected. This is most obvious when it comes to the climate and the environment, where animal agriculture is arguably the most destructive industry in human industry human history. You know, the only other contender is fossil fuels. And when you include non-climate impacts, I I don't know, I, I think it might go to animal ag. And so if already for climate and environmental reasons, we want people to eat a lot less meat, getting them to care about other animals is a great way to get them to do that. Um, in fact, people who go vegetarian for ethical reasons are much more likely to stay vegetarian than those who uh, do it for health or purely environmental reasons. Likewise, getting people to care about wild animals is a strong way to motivate them for climate action. Why would we give up ways to motivate people to do these things we need to do anyway? But the human-animal binary is also tied up with other forms of oppression, from patriarchy to white supremacy to ableism. You know, as Sudar Taylor mentioned earlier, in this, or as I quoted her earlier, um, it's ableism that says that animal ways of expressing themselves don't count. And historically, white supremacy is often um, has often functioned by comparing non-white people to animals, which at least some scholars, such as Afin Sil Ko and Claire Jean Kim, argue means that without deconstructing that human-animal binary, we won't be able to get rid of racial categories and racism, and vice versa. Um, you know, it's true that in practice, animal rights organizations are not always paragons of feminism and anti-racism, um, you know. They definitely need to do more on these fronts, but these causes are stronger connected, and there are at least compelling theoretical and practical arguments that, as the saying goes, no one can be free until we are all free. It's also not clear to me how becoming vegan would prevent you from fighting for other forms of justice. For instance, Cesar Chavez was perfectly capable of fighting for farm workers' rights while also being a proud vegetarianism or a, a proud vegetarian. The United Farm Workers President Arturo Rodriguez recollects that Caesar took genuine pride in producing numerous converts to vegetarianism over the decades. I'm one of them. Sometimes I think he took as much personal satisfaction from converting people to vegetarianism as he did to trade unionism. Chavez saw all liberation as connected. Racism, economic deprival, dogfighting, cockfighting, bullfighting, and rodeos are all cut from the same defective fabric. Violence, he said. Only when we have become nonviolent towards all life will we have learned to live well ourselves. He won a Lifetime Achievement Award um, from an animal rights group and said, We need in a special way to work twice as hard to make all people understand that animals are fellow creatures, that we must protect them and love them as we love ourselves. The basis for peace is respecting all creatures. We cannot defend and be kind to animals until we stop exploiting them in the name of science, exploiting them in the name of sport, exporting them in the name of fashion, and yes, exporting them in the name of food. Another example from movement history is Angela Davis, the famed prison abolitionist, who, in a conversation with Grace Lee Boggs, called veganism, quote, part of a revolutionary perspective, end quote, that can help us, quote, develop compassionate relations with the other creatures with whom we share this planet. In another talk, she argues, 
The fact that we can sit down and eat a piece of chicken without thinking about the horrendous conditions under which chickens are industrially bred in this country is a sign of the dangers of capitalism, how capitalism has colonized our minds. Again, both of them talk about how the different forms of oppression are connected. And I think this point about capitalism is key. It's somewhat astounding to me that the left hasn't um, gotten more excited about animal liberation, given that so fundamental to it is the idea of how we treat property. The idea that other living, breathing creatures can be our property, can be treated as objects rather than as other beings with whom we are in relation is fundamental to this, and this is why I think it'd be you know, difficult, if not impossible, to have a truly vegan society under capitalism, under a property regime, uh, where animals are not full people. If profit is the driver, the well-being of other beings, human or non-human, is not going to be a priority, and I think the left should be excited about the idea of uniting against an industry, animal agriculture, industrial farming, that readily exploits human workers, the environment, immigrants, and yes, animals. This should be a natural enemy of left and environmental movements. But it must include the animals. I mean, ultimately, if we have some sort of society-wide eco-socialist transformation that liberates humans but leaves the plight of animals the same, we are still living on a planet where the vast majority of thinking, feeling creatures are abused and exploited. That does not sound like justice to me. Some, in particular environmentalists, sometimes go the other way. They say the issue is not that, you know, animals are less than humans, but that all life should be treated equally. And so, yes, we have to eat to live, so it doesn't, as long as we're respectful, there's no huge difference between eating plants and animals. I don't think this argument holds in contemporary societies that are agriculture-based. Um, you know, raising animals as livestock means feeding them plants first. So if we genuinely cared about plants' rights, then we would kill fewer plants by eating all the plants directly um, than by feeding them to animals first and then eating the animals. Um, so even in this view, we should probably be vegan. Um, I do think there are, probably are, though, important moral differences between most animals and plants. Uh, creatures with brains and nervous systems that at least are closer to ours in some ways that we can more confidently speculate as to what they might be experiencing, even if there's so much we don't know and even if there's so much that is still mysterious about consciousness. I hesitate to speak too strongly about this, but due to similar brain structure and behavior, it's just much easier to argue that many animals most likely are conscious in a way that we don't know if plants are. Um, when I say many animals, I mean not only the vertebrates, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish, but many invertebrates as well, from octopuses to lobsters and crabs to even bees and shrimps. There's, you know, have central nervous systems. There's compelling evidence that there might be something going on in there. We're more hesitant to kick a dog than we are to pluck a leaf from a tree, and we may have good reasons for that. I should say that there is ample debate in the vegan community over something like an oyster, which doesn't have a central nervous system. Um, I tend to avoid eating oysters myself, but I do think, uh, you know, the goal, again, there's no such thing as a 100% pure food system. The goal is a food system that minimizes exploitation and suffering, um, and for the most part, that's going to be a food system that avoids farming other animals. I also think that often when people suggest that animals and plants should be treated equally, what they actually mean is that non-human animals and plants should be treated equally, and equally means below humans. Again, these people aren't suggesting cannibalism, typically. But at least some people are genuine in this argument, and I think, you know, it's, it's made thoughtfully in, in some indigenous worldviews. In the past, some largely white animal rights activists have historically employed racist rhetoric to target indigenous hunting practices, for instance, um, and it's not entirely clear whether a widespread plant-based diet would be healthy or sustainable in some regions, most obviously the Arctic, but maybe others, um, and definitely there's a worry that advocating against the killing of animals can at times constitute a form of cultural imperialism. 
Um, in practice, many uh, eco-feminist vegans argue for something called contextual moral vegetarianism, um, in which the moral case against killing is suspended when survival is at stake, um, as it arguably is in, in certain remote locations where plant food isn't a sustainable option. Um, you know, there's no unilateral indigenous view on these things. I don't think it's my role to adjudicate. Obviously, it's not. Um, but what I will say is that today, the majority of people, of whom there are billions and billions more than there were a few hundred years ago, or even a few decades ago, um, live in societies where they're not doing subsistence hunting and, and gathering uh, or fishing. And if all 8 billion tried to subsistence hunt and fish, there's a chance we would end up with even fewer wild animals left than there already are for the majority of us who live in industrialized or wealthy countries, or even those who don't. Often the sustainable option is going to be for us eating plants. And yes, we should fight for plant food to be more sustainable. We should fight for the plant agriculture industry to be much better to its workers. Um, I talked about this some with Lauren Ornelas of Food Empowerment Project on an earlier episode of the show. But I think plants are going to be the way forward for at least most of us. In fact, if anything, it's more than a little disingenuous to try to use indigenous worldviews as an excuse to you know, buy a burger at McDonald's when beef is causing the destruction of indigenous communities in the Amazon. So this has already gone longer than I had planned, but I'll wrap up with a couple more points. One is that someone could theoretically agree with me 100% ideologically and still say, you know, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, why should I change my diet? First off, I've heard this person hypothetically, but I've yet to meet this mythical person who is fully committed to the abolition of animal agriculture, but in the meantime, happily eats meat all the time. But I think it's a mistake to pretend that our individual consumption doesn't matter. For one, it's not individual. There are millions of vegetarianism, vegetarians and vegans making the same decisions, and collectively, you know, such a boycott does have some impact. Boycotts have been used as a tactic in strikes, in the abolition movement, and various other uh, social movements, and to say that boycott shouldn't apply here seems silly. And second, what we're trying to do is a cultural shift. And yes, that will obviously require legislation um, and political and legal change, but hopefully you don't want to just elect someone and then have them top down impose a you know radical vegan agenda that no one is prepared for. Um, this seems like a recipe for backlash, and also that person would never get elected. Um, some change needs to happen among everyday people before we get to that point. Um, and we want people to be ready and open to change um, when it comes along. And while almost nothing you can buy is truly ethical, even food or otherwise, I do think there's something particular about um, animal products and that especially meat is something that we, I at least don't want to exist. I'm trying to get rid of it. It's not that I want it to be produced humanely, unless maybe that means in a lab. Um, but is something I'm trying to get rid of. And so for me, that makes a boycott a more natural choice than it is for something like a banana, where the banana industry is grotesquely exploitative of its workers. Um, but I don't necessarily think we need to abolish bananas. We just need to change the way they're produced, maybe have less of them. And if I'm wrong here, and maybe I am, it's in the direction of we should boycott bananas, or at least we should boycott certain banana brands. And there are groups like Food Empowerment Project that do tie in a vegan ethic to avoiding, for instance, chocolates that are um, produced in exploitative conditions with, with slavery. If, so if I'm wrong, it's that we should be boycotting more plant foods too, not that we should stop boycotting meat. In an effort to create this cultural change and out of respect for the animals and to be part of a broader political boycott, we should stop eating meat. A couple other grab bag questions. Even if you're opposed to killing, can't there be humane dairy and eggs? Well, right now the dairy and eggs industries are totally tied up in the killing industries. The calves of dairy cows are taken away from them at you know a day old or younger um, because we need the milk, right? Um, and the male calves are given to the beef industry. Um, male chicks are ground up at birth. Um, and of course, when dairy cows or egg chickens are too old um, to keep producing at the rate required by capitalism to profit, 
they are also sent to slaughter. So right now you can't really separate the industries. And also in practice, egg farming is, if anything, more gruesome than uh, chickens raised for meat. But what if it weren't? There's still a fundamental issue here about what these animals are for, their purpose, as the whiteboards at the end of the episode uh, reminded me. So chickens are have been bred to lay far, far more eggs than they did even 100 years ago. Today, chickens lay around 300 eggs per year, and the closest living relatives of chickens in the wild lay maybe 10 to 12 eggs per year. So that's a 30-fold difference between chickens today and their closest wild relatives. This causes all sorts of health problems. Um, I've spoken with a woman who runs an animal sanctuary, and she says the number one cause of death for chickens are egg-related. Either the eggs get impacted on their way out, or um, the chickens suffer from ovarian cancer, which is linked to the number of ovulations. So basically, chickens have been bred to be egg-laying machines, and this causes health problems. If eggs remain a market commodity, something for sale, I worry that, again, egg production is going to take priority over the well-being of the hen. Um, we should let the hens you know, have healthy bodies and not keep them as machines. In dairy, similarly, there's the incentive, are we going to let their calves drink their milk or are we going to take it all? Um, so, you know, if there is some future humane egg industry, it looks nothing like today's. It produces far fewer eggs. And the eggs are just a byproduct, if anything, of the chickens just living happy, healthy lives. I do think the exact contours of our future relationship with other animals uh, are kind of up in the air morally for me. It's something I'm interested in uh, writing about more, something I'm um, going to grad school in the fall, in part to help think about. And I think there are tricky questions here, but again, insofar as animals' bodies or their products are commodities on the market, are things meant to make money for people then the well-being of the animal is not coming first. I hesitate to support prolonging industries that are rooted in treating the animal as production machines. Um, so that's my argument for veganism there. And maybe last one, uh, you may have heard of regenerative grazing, this idea that cows are going to save the planet um, because if you graze them in a certain way, they will help soil store carbon. The first thing to know about this is that a lot of articles about this are just extremely exaggerated about what the positive upsides will be. It's still not even proven that a net negative cattle ranch is even possible, uh, and if it is, that it is sufficiently negative to be particularly worth it. It's also the case that wild animals, for instance, uh, in the U.S. buffalo, uh, have more ecological benefits than grazing cattle, so if we really wanted to prioritize you know, soil carbon and other benefits, we would turn the land over to the wild. Um, and finally, even if it turns out cows are a good way to help the environment and help carbon, which again, as, as it is, the beef and dairy industries are huge saps on water, land, and their methane and, and carbon emissions are a major problem for the climate. But even if we found some way to fix that, uh, cows can graze without us having to eat them. We could see them as fellow workers in ecological restoration rather than as tools. On the subject of workers, obviously a last quick point is that this transition um, would ideally be a just transition of the sort people talk about for fossil fuel workers to get uh, training uh, and put them in other jobs. Um, also for people who work in animal farming, um, we would need government programs uh, to help them transition into other forms of agriculture or other environmentally beneficial jobs. And I think we should work with these workers to figure out what they want to do, how best they can do it, um, rather than simply tell them. Um, and this is something that left environmental movements should be doing right now already, I think. So anyway, that's the story of how I became a vegan how I began to believe that killing animals was wrong, how I began to believe that we could build an entirely vegan food system, and why I think the typical counterarguments are frustrating. And that's why I'm frustrated, and I, you know, I, I'm gearing this at least partially toward people who don't already agree to me, so I, I'm hesitant to express this frustration. But it is frustrating that other environmentalists and such haven't, haven't fully taken this up to the extent that um, I would hope that they would. It is a life goal of mine to see animal liberation and the fight against animal farming as part and parcel of a broader progressive 
environmental climate action movement. If you're interested in other podcasts about animals um, on my website I, and my list of resources, I also include some, some past podcasts I've done about animal rights specifically. Um, I'm also part of the Ivor Podcast Network. Um, you can go to ivorpod.com to look at some other uh, podcasts about animals you might enjoy. And yes, thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting season one of Storytelling Animals. Thank you for subscribing to my free weekly newsletter, if you haven't already. Thank you for supporting on Patreon, if you haven't already, patreon.com slash storytellingpod. And if you could leave a review, I would appreciate that. Um, I got a two-star review a while ago. You know, whoever you are, please let me know. Let me know how I can be better. I want to be better. The rest have all been five stars. Thank you. Um, You know, I love it if you think this podcast deserves five stars, if you give it five stars. Um, and yes, next book club, February 28th, Appleseed Matt Bell, um, late April book club, Wild Souls by Emma Maris. For updates, Patreon or the newsletter, all the links are in the episode description, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Hi. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D dot com. Ah!